Okay, I think this thing is on. Do you want to give the intro? Do you want me to give the intro? All right, let's do it together. Uh, this is Sarah. Come towards the microphone. <laughs> this is Sarah. This is Will. And we are the original transplants. <laughs> this is our inaugural podcast where we're going to share some news and experiences from the homestead here at Satayama Homestead. And you can find more online at satayamahs.org. Do you want to spell that? I will. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the cue, Will. <laughs> um, that's S-A-T-O-Y-A-M-A dot O-R-G. Sorry. H-S dot O-R-G. Satoyama. H-S dot O-R-G. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so looking at our agenda here. Well, let's just say it's Friday, July 3rd. Um, we'll thank Will's employer for giving him the day, the day off for the Independence holiday. Thank you. And so we've both been out and about all day. And I think some of the first things we're going to talk about is our various chores and our livestock, right? Yep. Yeah, we're sitting here under the umbrella. We're outside, so you may hear some sounds of nature and stuff. Sounds of nature, end of man. <laughs> but yeah, but we're we're outside. So we've done most of our chores for the day. I still have some on deck. Yeah. So let's talk about the chickens, I guess, first. Yeah, chickens, first thing on the agenda, besides intro. So, um, as you may have seen if you've looked at our Tumblr, spreadcast.tumblr.com, uh, I designed and built the chicken tractor condo complete with nesting loft that we have our four uh, laying pullets in right now. And one of the minor problems I've had because of the fact that I had to cut down the plywood to fit in our vehicle to transport it was that there's a seam running down the sides of the chicken tractor between the two pieces of plywood that make up the wall, which uh, was experiencing some water penetration, so we say, during our unseasonably heavy rains this summer. The chickens were wet. A little bit wet. They didn't seem too bothered, and I always changed their litter in a timely fashion, so they always had... Uh, dry fresh pine shavings but that's beside the point what what we needed was a long-term solution so today I did actually one of Will's favorite tasks which is caulking I caulked those seams um, in the chicken tractor condo and uh, hopefully that'll set because today is a nice sunny dry day and for that'll now, uh, make now. them happier in the rain so that was the first chicken shore I also obviously fed and watered them and we let them out, and we provided them with some treats, right? We had mm -hmm. leftover uh, turnip greens and turnips top, tops and bottoms from last night's dinner, as well as some sluggy berries and cherries uh, from our brambles and from our cherry trees, which I don't think we've actually really spoken about very much yet, but we had a surprise grove of cherries that we found on the property this year. Uh, so that's been great. Uh, we think we have black cherries as well as fire pin cherries, because we've got a black right variety and a red right variety. I like the name fire pin. And, that's awesome. Oh, uh, that's too fire or, or pin. Oh, fire or pin. <laughs> yeah, not yeah. fire pin. Not uh, fire pin. Danger Will Robinson. Fire cherries. Fire cherries are still pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they've, so back to the chickens, they've pretty much been having the run of the yard all day, but they've been hanging out in their favorite spot, which is right on the, what would you call that, southeast corner of the house. Yeah. Underneath the shrubbery, the rhododendron, and the evergreen bush there, uh, where it's shady, and because of the chimney, they have sort of protection on two sides at all times. Uh, so I think they feel secure there. They can also take dust baths because it's reasonably protected from all the rain, so the dirt is nice and loose and dry so they've been dust bathing sun napping uh preening and generally wreaking havoc on the living mulch there the mock strawberry they like the hosta and the hosta yeah they're eating all the hosta which they're converting to meat and eggs so and manure so we're, we're all right with it uh so that's the chickens you had a really good day at the apiary at the apiary so why don't you tell us about the bees makes it sound like the apiary is far away but it's really just walk up the yard and, and you get to the apiary so the bees um let's see i think it was a couple weeks ago i noticed that they had slowed down a little bit um three weeks ago i could check my calendar could have brought that out but uh, they uh they seemed to be a little sluggish they were hanging out on the front porch not doing any work and if there's one thing i, I can't abide it's lazy bees they don't <laughs> do any work so i was thinking of ripping the hive open but we've had some i don't know rainy or the farmer next door calls it monsoonal mm -hmm. weather so it's been um tough for the bees to actually get out they actually can't fly during the rain they can't fly during cool temperatures i think their bodies need to be somewhere in the 90s of degrees in order to actually make it 
off the ground. So um, they haven't been able to fly around. They haven't been collecting much honey, whereas before that they had been putting... Um, you mean nectar or pollen? I'm sorry. Collecting nectar in order to make their honey. They had been um, expanding pretty rapidly before that. Yeah. So I'm worried. Here I am. I'm looking at the bees. Um, well, we can say, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but so you receive your packages on April 4th. Tomorrow is being July 4th. So May, yeah. June, July, it'll be three months of yeah. having the hive set up. And um, each, I'm, I'm running all medium supers, which means I'm using all one piece of equipment. And they're stacked four high, which seems to be pretty decent expansion for the whole, for, for that amount of time, three months. Mm -hmm. It's great. So um, today, we actually had a sunny day for the first time in about three weeks. And uh, I opened up the hives and I could see that the friendly hive is how, is how I referred to it. The one that hasn't stung me yet. Um, the one that we'll unpack and set up first as well. Yes. They're generally the nicer hive. They, they don't have a bad attitude. They, uh, they don't mind if I sit near them. They actually had um, plenty of eggs. So I grabbed a frame of eggs out of the hive. Um, so that's a honeycomb with eggs at the bottom of the cells. And they have a little honey on there. And they had nurse bees who feed the um, baby bees in, you know, once they've hatched from the egg. Moved that over to the ornery hive, the hive I unpacked second. That's, Thankfully, probably. Yes, because I probably would have quit beekeeping and <laughs> that would have been it right on the spot. Uh, they, they've stung me eight times, I think nine times today, although the sting today was unexpected. So anyway, I went to drop the eggs into the other hive to help it out, give it a, give it a little boost. Because um, you've observed a behavioral change in that hive? I have, and I'm using Michael Bush's um, bottom line upfront mef method. It's uh, B-L-U-F. And that means um, the most simple way to uh, help your hives out, if you have to, and you really should have to if you're starting out, is to transfer eggs from one to the other. So, um, so is that like the Occam's razor of beekeeping? Yeah. Is that what that's called? Yeah, The simplest exactly. uh, explanation, simplest approach? That's why, yeah, that's why he calls it bottom line up front. whole idea is to give them, um, you're going to give them extra bees. You're going to give them uh, the possibility of raising a queen if they've lost their queen. And generally, it's just going to strengthen the hive. And since I have two of the same breed of bees, um, I think in general, it seems to work out. They fought a little bit, so I smoked the heck out of them. Uh, to make sure that the smoke always calms me down too. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't? Um, and uh, yeah, the, I actually stole, took, as payment, borrowed, borrowed two frames of honey because they've um, levied a tax. Yes, you have to pay rent around here if you're going to stay here. We're, we're not going to let you just lay about and. Uh, siphon up resources. And it's an in-kind exchange. In-kind exchange. With nature. I took it from them. And they were not happy about it. They were clinging to it. But I took fr two frames of honey out, which we did a couple... We actually did two frames from the friendly hive. Um, I would say that produced anywhere from a quart to a half gallon of honey. Quart to a half gallon. Confidently. That sounds, that sounds right, yeah. Actually, we did talk about that because you have a really interesting extraction setup. Oh, okay, yeah, I can uh, talk about that. Which g gave us good reason to believe that we had about a tenth of a five-gallon bucket, which would be about a half gallon. Yes. So, um, well, let me, let me explain. So I closed up the hives. Um, I flipped the entrance reducer around so that the bees have about a one-inch entrance on the ornery hive. Um, and why was that? Well, that was because this time of year is called the dearth which means there isn't as much nectar. There's no uh, tree nectar. There's no bramble nectar. Um, so they are sort of in, in a spot where they're starting to eat their own honey. Um, now, really, they need honey for the winter because there's still nectar, as you've pointed out to me. There's still, you see it all over the place. There's uh, daisies. There's uh, chamomile. There's all kinds of, we have borage coming in. We have raspberries coming in. There's plenty of things in, uh, you can still make honey out of, but... Um, Calendula, all, everything in the kitchen garden. Yeah. And so... Well, what were, did you see some behavioral signs of that kind of nectar pollen scarcity? Yes, they... She, uh, the queen stopped laying as many eggs. Before, I don't know, I want to say mid-June, they had been reproducing extremely quickly to the point where... Um, 
they were they were probably overpopulated. So mm -hmm. I kept having to expand the. It's also some very hive. intense bearding, especially on the ornery bearding, hive. Bearding, which is yeah. where the bees hang outside the hive and uh, ventilate themselves. Mm -hmm. And also, um, maybe this was interspecial, but I thought it was between hives too. You saw some robbing. Yes, I did see a little bit of robbing. And I saw wasps that were hanging out, and uh, that's usually a bad sign. Once those uh, wasps learn how to how to rob, it's not good. So the bees have been... We've actually had friends who were beekeepers who had to give up, take a break for a couple of years because yeah. of wasp robbing. Right? Now, then again, they also had a swarm come mm -hmm. right back into their old hive. Oh. So they actually are beekeepers again, huh. which is kind of cool. What I cool. thought was like a genetic memory I think this thing. is a good year for beekeeping, I yeah. think, in general. So I stole I stole some honey. I skimmed off the top um, just because they're, um, they actually needed room for the um, eggs. So I had to take out, you know, look at me. I just I had to take out the had frame. Had to make some room. Right. It's a real sacrifice, you know, collecting all this honey. So, so talk about your extraction method for the honey. So we're going to bring it downstairs. Um, I have two five-gallon buckets. I actually bought this kit from Bushy Mountain Beekeeping because Brushy we went Mountain. to Brushy Mountain. Mm -hmm. Because we went to um, a, not unsolicited endorsement. <laughs> yes, but all my equipment's from them. All of it, every single piece. Um, the uh, the the local big blue store didn't have um, food safe buckets, so you can actually do this yourself. There's recipes on the internet, but I have a kit, two five gallon. No shame food. in a kit. No, I I think it's. I mean, the amount of time broke, I would have. Yeah, the amount of time I would have spent driving around trying to find food safe buckets. Um, two five gallon buckets it's got a filtration system which is basically holes drilled in the bottom of the top bucket and it can be cheesecloth or some kind of um, filtering sack for the uh, wax mm -hmm. drips down through a hole sizable hole in the cover on the bottom bucket mm -hmm. and that's there to basically support the top bucket as um, the weight transfers the weight of the honey transfers from the top to the bottom bucket the bottom bucket, um, if you're doing it at home, you can just do a, uh, a bottom bucket and just have a catch in there and then pour it out. But actually the kit I have has a tap, mm -hmm. which is really, makes it really easy. A honey tap. Honey tap. It's like the best tap ever. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're going to do some extracting. You mash it up with your hands. I mean, you can mash it up with a potato masher like that video we watched on the internet, but mm -hmm. why would you do that when you could do it with your hands? Yeah. Wash your hands first. Indeed. Yes. Um, and I sanitize the buckets in between, make mm -hmm. sure that, because um, we actually already have, yeah, we actually already have honey, so. Yeah. Yeah, so This that's, is our second extraction, and we will apply what we learned from the first extraction we'll to the second We'll take pictures one. this time, too. Take pictures and uh, open the drop cloth wider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because luckily it's pretty easy to clean up, but it is a messy process, so, um, so yeah. That's the bees update. They're looking good. Excellent. Um, I, Congratulations. I put yeah, I put eggs in the other hive so that um, if they're having any queen problems, laying problems, they'll uh, they'll be all right. So one thing I wanted to point out too is you expressed how good of a year it's been. You think for local beekeeping, and we've had some confirmation of that from other local apiculturists. Um, last spring was really rough in our location. We had a terrible hailstorm come through on May 22nd. Yeah. And I believe that it did a lot of foliar damage to the plants that were coming in and knocked a lot of flowers off of fruiting plants. Um, that's why we had no idea about the cherries would be my guess. My guess is the flowering you know, bodies were damaged in that hailstorm. Was it May 22nd? Um, it also, yes. So that's like the height of flowering. Yeah, it set back our bramble. So this year we had an early crop of black raspberries that's really helped us fill the gap between our strawberries uh, fruiting out and our cultivated raspberries fruiting out. So we've got black raspberries, which we've been harvesting along with the cherries. And we know that we have just coming in now the cultivated uh, red and yellow raspberries. Um, which are the original transplants, by the way, the inspiration the behind transplant. our title. Um, when we moved in late October of 2013, we brought with us some transplanted raspberry canes and some transplanted strawberry runners uh, from our rental duplex down in Delaware County. Yes. And we had to get them in the ground. So really, that was the first thing that we planted when we got here. And uh, the strawberries treated us really well this season. We had our first few picks in at the end of May, I want to say, and then a very mm -hmm. solid month of June with strawberry harvest. We have a number frozen for jamming. Um, jamming. Jamming. We be jamming. We be jamming. The raspberries are just coming in now and look phenomenal. And we've actually um, 
uprooted and potted up some runners to share with folks in the area. So that's been great. And as I said, we've been harvesting black raspberries, which we didn't realize we had. We've also seen some dewberries, we believe, the, uh, yeah. the small, small shrub blackberry. And we know we've got wineberries coming in very soon and blackberries on the horizon as well. Yeah. So we're psyched about that. Those are the original transplants. Um, in terms of chores, after taking care of the chickens and having our breakfast. Nice segue, by the way. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I did some work on our paths. So we refer to our acreage or so of uh, what was formerly grass turf as the yard. And we, we call it a no-mow yard or a no-mow lawn. And that's mostly true. Um, we don't have a conventionally powered mode, mower, either electric or gas powered or anything of the sort. We have a real push mower. Um, we also have a collection of hand tools, including a scythe, a sickle, um, various sizes of grass shears. Um, and pruners that we use to manage um, the green things that grow at Satayama. And today it was a day to deal with the mowed paths. So in order to get around and about our yard when the meadow comes in, we installed some paths. Some of them are mulched, uh, which is great. They're relatively low maintenance. We have to do some weeding and we've done a couple of layers of uh, local wood chips at this point. I think that's gonna stabilize over time. The rest of the paths to get to some of our secondary points of interest on the property are mowed with the real mower. And that's what I worked on today. The R-E-A-L mower? R it's real, real. R-E-A-L, <laughs> R-E-E-L. You can Google it. Um, so that typically takes between two and three hours. I would say because of all the rain, alternating rain and sun we've had over the past week and a half or so since we've last mowed it, we've had a lot of growth. Um, so that probably took me about three hours. I had to take a couple of breaks for rehydration and homemade electrolyte drinks and taking breaks in the shade, etc. Maybe you should talk about why we don't have a conventionally powered mower. Like why, why are we doing it that way? Well, there's definitely a couple of reasons. Um, one is economic. It was actually a lot cheaper to invest in hand tools that we could sharpen ourselves than it was to invest in a conventionally powered mower. Um, one was um, phobic. I have a phobia of mechanical things because I can't repair them myself. <laughs> and I, it's an ongoing cost to maintain and repair something that you can't manage yourself. Um, and there were so many other things that we were in the process of learning since we've moved here over the past 18 months that I didn't feel like small engine repair was something that I could tack on. Although we can talk about a small engine that I did per break down and purchase if you want. Yeah. Break no pun intended, it hasn't actually broken down. Um, <laughs> no, there's no. also, uh, you know, I, Sarah, personally have a strong... Um, affiliation with the Luddite movement in the labor uh, traditional sense of the term, I think that technology is no substitute for good old fashioned elbow grease. And when you enjoy your work, which I definitely do, you know, people ask us what our hobbies are and we say yard work. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, I figure total maintenance on the yard between scything and mowing and, and other things that we have to do probably averages about eight hours a week. So if you consider the amount of time you spend working out or at the gym or watching TV, yeah. um, I don't partake of any of those activities, but I do a ton of yard work and it seems to have come to a similar effect anyway. So, um, so you know, the Luddite sort of technophobia um, and, I, and it being a hobby and just interesting. I really enjoy using the scythe. It's awesome exercise. I think it's probably bad ASS <laughs> when people drive by and they see us using it. <laughs> um, so there's a little sense of um, that going on. Um, confidence booster. You Did you talk say. about fossil fuels? We, we, I didn't even talk about fossil fuels at all. So um, when you consider... Um, the externalization, yeah, externalizing yeah, yeah, yeah. of all go. of the costs associated with using fossil fuels. We pay a very cheap price for gas, for petroleum, for electricity, which is produced by conventional means. Um, we certainly don't pay what it costs to produce in terms of loss of habitat, impact on the environment, impact on people. Um, and, and so I think that I try to be very intentional and strategic and, and minimalist in my use of those things. And one of our trade-offs for moving out this way was we both took on a longer car commute to get to work. 
um, you've done a little yeah. bit of public transportation, but you still have to drive a good distance, I would say, probably 10 miles. And I mean, just to get to the store, you have to drive, too. Exactly. It's not walkable. So I try to, when I do run errands, I try to hit multiple points, you yeah. know, hit multiple errands in one trip. Um, and so, you know, even though we went from managing probably close to a tenth of an acre or so, a six, you know, small parcel at our rental to having you know, to two and a third acres, about an acre of which is turfed here. Um, one of the things that we did is started um, aggressively, intensively planting primarily edible perennials and native perennials to take up some turf. We um, did some lasagna composting to create our kitchen garden beds, which we might talk about a little bit more yeah, when we cover we'll to ag news. news. Yeah. yeah. And um, so that's taken up some turf space. And then the rest of it, we've pretty much let go to meadow, except for these strategic areas that we either mulch paths on or, or mow paths on on an ongoing basis. So that was my primary tour for this morning. Then we broke for lunch. Now we're working on the original transplants podcast and after lunch i'm still toying around with the idea of doing some foliage maintenance some weed whipping down at our gravel driveway which is kind of growing in a little bit and getting crazy and possibly also doing a little bit of tilling in those um, ornamental beds and planting some zinnias which are uh, pollinators particularly the butterflies were really digging last year and i was hoping that they would self-seed and they did not so I'm thinking it would be a good day to do all that. And the only other thing that would, had been on my to-do list was compost spreading. I think yeah. the compost in the uh, the tumbler enclosure is mature enough now that we can use it in the garden and start a new batch. So that's what's on my to-do list horizon. Some of that <laughs> might quite, get pushed off to tomorrow. Quite a bit. But as I said, it's what I enjoy doing, so it's all good. I enjoy Work is it. love made visible, right? As Kaloga Brown mm, said yeah, at the profit. Um, yeah, I cut up a tree this morning. Yeah, a dead tree, a fallen tree. The Not tree that tree, fell in yeah. the ice storms of the winter of 2013 to 14. Yeah, so I figured it's seasoned <laughs> by now. and An oak. I, I actually gave back to um, the forest a little bit, um, leaving the uh, the main stump there so that uh, you know different animals can live in it. That's a hardwood, too. I think we could do mushroom plugs in there. Yeah, we could. Um, so, yeah, that's it for chores. Uh, wow, your your chore segment was short and sweet, honey. I cut up a tree. I mean, you also did your honey extraction, which we also talked already talked about. So yeah, but that was first thing. I mean, that took me that took me all morning to do the uh, to do the tree. Yeah, and like had to refuel the chainsaw once. That's one. That's, Indeed. That's one gas powered thing. I don't think I can do with. Yeah. That. So we had mentioned we do have some conventionally powered pieces of equipment. One is the chainsaw, and and another is the generator. Um, yep. And when we moved here, two of our neighbors, independently of each other, as far as we know, advised us that you would need three things to survive out here: a chainsaw, a generator, and a gun. And so in terms of conventionally powered pieces of equipment, we certainly have um, the generator and the chainsaw, and they have been indispensable, I would say. Because our yeah. our pump, our well pump, requires electricity. So in order to have water and during power outages, we have to run the generator. We lose power at the weirdest times, too. It'll, mm-hmm. be, it'll be a sunny day. I think they do some load balancing out here. Yeah, for air conditioning. And then, so yeah, the chainsaw. Um, Which we don't have, but other people do. <laughs> I don't know. The chainsaw is required. It's same with the generator. You just need it. I mean, you could get a two-person saw, but we we would spend the all morning cutting, and then you wouldn't also have. I don't know. The chainsaw it can be flexible. Like one of the things was when you're chainsawing a log and it's close to the ground, you don't want to get it in the dirt. Mm-hmm. That'll dull the blade. It'll dull the blade almost immediately. So you have to shift it around as you're cutting through the log mm-hmm. to make sure you're not hitting the ground. You can't. I don't think you have that level of control with one of those cross-cut saws or if you do you have to work much harder to to have it so mm-hmm. yeah i could have spent three days doing the uh, doing the tree but sure spent one morning so another thing that you purchased sort of over my uh protest but it came in handy was the leaf blower the leaf blower now here's the thing as I said, I love yard work, and one of the pieces of seasonal yard work that I really enjoy is raking. I don't enjoy raking. So I would always be racing Will home from work to make sure that I got in a few minutes of raking before he broke out the leaf blower. But to his credit, he really only used it, would you say, three times in the season? That's all, yeah. Yeah. Um, the rest we did by raking, which if you um, ever visit Satayama Homestead, you will see, was no easy task. But it is one that I absolutely enjoy. 
which segues into our final piece of conventionally powered equipment, which is actually one that I purchased yeah, that's after purchased. some research last summer around this time. Yeah. Um, and that's our chipper shredder. We have a Bearcat chipper shredder. Um, what is it? Six or eight horsepower? Um, a lot of horses. Yeah. Briggs Meyer engine. Um, that thing is a beast, but. I got it used on consignment at a local equipment dealer in Reading, um, unsolicited endorsement for walkers, and <laughs> um, works like a charm. So what we would do is rake and or blow the leaves down into a pile alongside our pole barn, and that's where we um, chip and shred what do you all do that kind of... Yeah, I'm getting to it. No, oh, you are. So okay. first we chip and shred the raw material, right, um, which basically creates an enormous uh, leaf mulch compost pile. And we skim off of that to mulch all of our garden beds. Um, so the kitchen garden is primarily composted and mulched by that. All of the ornamental beds are primarily um, mulched by that. And that's what we use to top dress primarily going into the winter season um, for our perennials is the leaf mulch, which also creates an awesome habitat. Um, we've seen toads in it, turtles in it, rabbits and their baby bunnies in it, snakes in it. The chickens love to peck around in it. The birds love to toss it around and find grubs and everything going on underneath. Uh, obviously, for vermiculture, for vermicompost, uh, a worm compost, it was an excellent habitat to bring in earthworms and other beneficial nematodes. So um, that was a good investment. I got it at less than half list price because I bought it on consignment. And as long as we take care of it, ahem, and don't put metal soil yeah, rakes in it, ahem, yeah. <laughs> uh, it should treat us well for years to come and really help us reuse um, the raw materials that we have available here on the homestead, as we mentioned, mulching and composting with the leaves that fall, um, which is sort of part of our operating mission for Satayama Homestead, sustainable agriculture and horticulture with materials sourced locally or on site. So. That, I think, ties up chores. Yeah, we did plenty of chores today. And, um, yeah, I guess I might actually put in that. We're, we're trying to repair the patio, and I may I may put in one of those timbers this afternoon. Wow, see how saucy. I feel. <laughs> Some hardscaping projects. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, so, Lancaster Farming and uh, the news. Yeah, so... Beep, 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 oh, snap, beep, beep. this just in. <laughs> so really, we want to thank Lancaster Farming for delivering their Saturday, July 4th edition a day early due to the holiday. Uh, unsolicited endorsement. I recommend... Unsolicited endorsement. Absolutely. I recommend checking them out online if you are not in their delivery um, subscription area. They're at lancasterfarming.com. And we wanted to highlight a couple of the articles from the A section today. The first one is their cover article, Let Nature Help Manage Pastures, written by Philip Gruber, who's one of their staff writers. This is out of Kirkwood, PA. And they're highlighting a man named Ian Mitchell Inns, who says he likes grazing to be low tech and high intensity. So to quote from the article, uh, the South African rancher managing in harmony with the environment works better than relying on the machinery and inputs modern agriculture seems to require. This is quoting Mitchell Inns himself. The minute you go against nature, you will go broke. Hey, I find that quote very telling, and I, like I would agree with the sentiment. Um, he practices what's called mob grazing, which calls for high stocking densities and frequent pasture changes. Right. Um, the idea, he says, is to manage cattle the way they used to live in the wild. Go figure. And one of the phenomena that he talks about in the article is that a cow should ideally only take one bite from a plant, because that's going to allow it to regrow, and the, the um, cow can return to that pasture and eat from that plant again. Oh, There's something called the second bite you know, syndrome when your pasture gets all the way eaten down to the bare nubs and you're seeing bare soil underneath. Another person that you'll see write about that is Joel Salatine. He's syndicated uh, as a columnist in Mother Earth News and he uh, talks a lot about second bites and how he pastures his grazing animals as well. So we wanted to give again unsolicited endorsement of Lancaster Farming for this cover article, Let Nature Help Manage Pastures, written by staff writer Philip Gruber, highlighting Ian Mitchell Eanes, a rancher in Kirkwood, PA. I like the second bite concept. It makes a lot of sense to me. Exactly. I mean, you, right. you, mean you go around and, and you see different pastures and they've been eaten down to the mud. Right. And then all the topsoil blows away in the wind. And uh, 
you're you're in a dust bowl you're now in a dust bowl and it's going to take years for that to rehab and i'm actually glad you mentioned that because uh another thing that joel salatine has written about and that we've adopted here at satayama homestead is the way that we um house our chickens we use a mobile chicken tractor condo as we mentioned and that helps us pasture the chickens essentially throughout the homestead. So we're distributing their impact on the environment. Obviously they nibble the grass down to nubs and that's your cue that you need to move uh, the chicken tractor because it has an enclosed run underneath. So if for some reason we're gonna be away, um, we'll enclose the chickens with hardware cloth panels that we added on to the bottom of their chicken tractor. And that gives them an area to forage in that's reasonably protected. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know overly optimistic that a really uh, ambitious fox couldn't get in yeah. there. But, you know, it, it probably from hawks and things like that, they're fine. Definitely hawks, yeah. So the chicken tractor, the whole concept is it's mobile. You pasture them throughout your area. They're going to distribute their nitrogen-rich manure. They're going to distribute their impact on the environment. Um, and everybody's happy. And they have fresh forage on a regular basis. So that's good. So that relates back to that last article about managing pastures in harmony with nature. Uh, we also want to give an unsolicited shout out to the Pennsylvania No-Till Alliance. This is a, uh, another article from Lancaster Farming. They're celebrating their 10th anniversary, so congratulations. They're having a soil health field day to celebrate beginning at 8 a.m. on Tuesday, July 28th at Hershey Farms near Elizabethtown. Uh, that soil health field day is going to feature a panel discussion, a soil health demonstration, field walk, uh, walks and discussions of cover crop field plots and interseeded plots. And when I read about that, I recognize you, you know, realized that's something that we did in the, our biointensive kitchen garden here. We planted a cover crop of Austrian winter pea prior to planting our three sisters' milpa beds, which is our corn, our beans, and our squash. And interseeded plots, I'd have to look up more information on that, but it reminded me of the fact that our garden is what we call biointensive or companion planted, meaning a lot of plants are co-planted together. Uh, we co-plant tomatoes with carrots, um, beans throughout. Uh, we mentioned the three sisters. The beans fix nitrogen for the corn, which is a heavy fertilizer feeder, um, and also trellis on the corn, which I think probably helps keep it rooted in these heavy winds we've been having in terms of their shallow root system. And then the squash sprawls around on the ground, sprawls around on the ground, <laughs> out on the ground, and um, is a weed blocker, a natural weed blocker. So that's the way that that interseeded companion planted biointensive system I mean, works. My per professional on opinion um interceded i feel like that means the same thing yeah as, as unprofessional a, opinion yeah unprofessional. <laughs> so we could do some more research on that but that's our interpretation um the other thing i wanted to mention about no-till is our we sort of touched on this but our biointensive kitchen plots the gardens themselves are not raised beds we didn't do any tilling we didn't turn over any turf what we did is called sheet composting or in situ composting or lasagna gardening where we created layers of cardboard, which we had plenty of from our moving boxes at the end of 2013, um, layered with compost, leaf mulch, um, grass clippings, newspaper, um, and straw on top to keep everything warm and, and contained. And I'd say we probably had 18 inches worth of material piled up on those yeah, plots. It looks like a uh, looks like a, a big furry monster. Like Lying. Falcor hanging out on your front yard. <laughs> Falcor. <laughs> All right. Unsolicited shout out to the never ending story. Um, so, so that was in fall of 2013. By spring of 2014, we had uh, reasonable vegetable uh, gardens that we could plant transplants in. Our seeded plants didn't do great. But then this year, so 18 months later, um, for the spring 2015 planting season, they were in really excellent shape. They like A lot of earthworms in the down. earthworm census. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it breaks down. It goes down to ground. So, level. shout out for No Till celebrating their 10th anniversary. Moving right along through the newspaper here, let's talk about avian influenza because it's most likely, if not already, in Pennsylvania, coming to Pennsylvania. Um, this is an excerpt from Preparing Pennsylvania's Flock Against Avian Influenza, written by Russell Redding, who is Pennsylvania's Secretary of Agriculture. Hmm. He has a section in this article called Outdoor Poultry Producers, so I'm just going to quote some excerpts here. Pennsylvania is home to a growing number of backyard and commercial pastured poultry flocks with varied management styles. I would include us in that, you know, we're a backyard uh, four pullet uh, poultry operation right now. 
No matter the size of your operation, he says, your best prevention efforts for avian influenza are the same as those listed for conventional flocks. Uh, quoting, be vigilant about preventing interaction between your poultry and wild birds and in preventing rodent access to feed. Hmm. Consider closed, movable shelters, chicken right. tractor, right, and exclusion netting. At the very least, restrict your flock's access to ponds, streams, or other bodies of water frequented by wild waterfowl. He also mentions talking to the staff at these, um, under the Secretary of Agriculture about obtaining what he calls a premise identification number. So that's something we're going to look into more. And then for first response, he says, quote, report serious or unusual animal health problems to your veterinarian, local extension office, or state or federal animal health officials. You can also contact the Pennsylvania Department's Bureau of Animal Health and Diagnostic Services 24-hour phone line at 717-772-2852. So again, in response to this article, I feel like we're pretty well prepared. Um, our yard, we don't witness waterfowl in. We have seen no. uh, wild turkeys, two hens with their combined brood, and a number of nesting birds, uh, mm -hmm. but no waterfowl. And because we're using an enclosed movable shelter, namely the chicken tractor condo, I feel pretty good about that. Uh, we keep it very clean, we keep it dry. The only things we're not currently doing that we could keep in mind for the future are the exclusion netting. And, um, you know, I'm going to look more into the implications of the premise identification number and what that would mean. Uh, but that's something for us to keep in mind. I think that's going to take us into, oh, we've got the editorial and then I believe we're in the ad briefs. So, uh, again, we're in Lancaster Farming in their A section for Saturday, July 4th, which, thanks again, they delivered a day early. Um, their editor, Dennis Larrison, wrote this editorial entitled The Roots of Independence. Uh, and it's a really interesting survey on the relationship between early agriculture and the independence movement um, and the Continental Army in the United States. So I'm going to quote some sections here from his article, from his editorial. Uh, he says, to encourage settlement in the New World, the European aristocracy had offered land grants, large parcels along the waterways for the gentry and smaller allotments further inland for the peasantry. Quote, it took a lot of hard work and gumption for those small subsistence farmers to survive on the edge of the wilderness. And I always kind of feel like we're there. I don't know if yep. you can hear the gunshots in the background, but, <laughs> but up against the thin portion of a private uh, trust that's not open to the public, which then is a bu buffer uh, with the game lands, the state game lands, uh, which does has a a, a, an outdoor public shooting range. So we're on the edge of the wilderness, I kind of feel. Absolutely. According again, it was their hardy independence that laid the foundation for the spirit of 1776. Quoting, imagine what life was like for the farmers who made up 90% of the entire American workforce in those days. I don't know what the figure is now, but I know there's generally been a concern about the graying of the agricultural industry. Um, the average age, I think, is in the upper 50s of those engaged in agriculture in the United States. So and the 90. shrinking and, and um, concentration, um, commercial you know, merger and acquisitions, the concentration of control of agriculture in our country by a few companies. So 90% of the United States used to be... Agricultural workforce. Agricultural workforce. That's I mean, I think it's here. the opposite now. I think it's 10% is agricultural. I mean, you know. Feeding a much larger population. Give or take as well. 5%. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, I think it's the opposite now. Wow. So, you know, interesting. Um, so he says at that time in the 1770s, it would be another, nearly another 20 years before Thomas Jefferson introduced the revolutionary moldboard plow. Seeds were sown by hand and the crops were cultivated with hoes, which we still do here at Satyama. This was interesting. The cradle and scythe, which is one of the, our key tools for maintaining our nomo lawn, weren't introduced until the 1790s. So all the hay and grain had to be cut by sickle, which we also use, and the threshing done with a flail. A lot of hard labor going into agricultural Jeez. production. Quoting, but frontier farmers had also adopted many other crops from Native Americans, including corn, sweet potatoes, tomatoes, pumpkins, watermelons, beans, berries, maple sugar, tobacco, and cotton. So if you have any of those products in your life, you can thank a local American who was here before the European settlers wow, got that, here. All of that stuff was Native American cultivated? Yes. Wow. Um, corn has a fascinating history from its sure. beginnings as a grass to something that feeds us and now fuels us. Um, Quoting again, still other grains along with sweet sorghum, melons, okra, and peanuts were imported from Africa with the slave trade. Down at the bottom, he notes the relationship between agriculture and the Continental Army and the, the war for independence. 
Um, prior to the War for Independence, state militias, including Pennsylvania, where we live, had offered land bounties on their western edges. Similar land grants were promised for service in the Continental Army. So we're really talking about a, a nation whose um, leading political minds were gentlemen farmers, many of them, and whose agri uh, uh, productive workers, the workforce, was 90% agricultural and whose settlers were overwhelmingly agricultural, whose mercenaries and fighters were overwhelmingly agricultural. So I just thought that that was interesting. So I want to thank Dennis Lar Larison, unsolicited endorsement for his editorial Roots of Independence. Shout out to Independence. Indeed. And we're going to wrap up with a, a highlight from the Ag Briefs. Just let me flip there. It's towards the end of Section A of Lancaster Farming. We're in the July 4th edition here. And I'm going to let turn this over to Will, actually. Yeah, I'll read the brief. So there you go. Just the one. Just the one. All right. Idaho Falls, Idaho. <laughs> Why don't you read the headline there? Truck Tips releases 20 million bees in Idaho. <laughs> More than 20 million bees being shipped from Idaho to North Dakota were lost when a tractor trailer carrying the insects tipped onto its side near a nuclear facility. Oh, what? I hadn't read that far. Nuclear bees. Nuclear bees. I think there's a plot line in there somewhere. Yeah. Moving along. Wow. Firefighters in plastic suits from Idaho National Laboratory responded to the crash on June 25th and sprayed foam fire retardant to disperse the swarming bees. Uh, the bees were being shipped to North Dakota to pollinate crops and make honey. The area where the crash occurred is in the eastern Ohio desert. Nuclear facilities at the 890 square mile lab site are far from the main road. Several motorcyclists were stung when they drove past the crash site. So let's like set the scene here. You're, you're in a motorcycle group. You're just cruising along, Idaho. Easy rider style. Easy rider. You're in the Idaho desert. You know, sounds like a lot of fun. Wind is in your hair. You can't hear anything because you're on a your motorcycle. Teeth. <laughs> you're grinning your teeth, bugs flying into your eyes. <laughs> and then before you know it, there are stinging bugs flying into your eyes, stinging you in the eye. Nuclear stinging bugs. Right, and they're radioactive. Potentially. We're not actually, that's not actually in the brief, that's our interpretation. Um, but it's the better one. Would you also like to talk about, since we read that far, is there more to the brief? That's it. Um, I was well, wondering if get. you wanted to offer some reflection on commercial apiculture. Uh, well, commercial pollination. Yeah, what's interesting here is the um, the bees were being shipped for pollination between Idaho and North Dakota. Through a desert. Through a desert. So when you uh, when you need to pollinate your, your crops using honeybees, um, you're basically making the bees completely reliant on... Um, your single crop. So in this case, did, Monocropic did it collect. say what? I don't think it said what the uh, no. It just said pollinate crops and make honey. So um, you know, if you're raising, or in Idaho, potatoes. No, potatoes don't really. They do flower. They do flower, but I'm sure they have crop farms. Mm. I mean, corn is wind pollinated, of course. Yeah. So maybe even soybeans. Soybeans are um, put out blossoms, so they're mm -hmm. pollinated by pollinators. So you bring, you transport honeybees to one of these big fields, and then you let them stay there. Um, there's a lot of science out there, and I don't have any of it in front of me, which is unfortunate. But um, talking about how this visit the library. Yes, visit the library, and maybe we can put some up in the show notes. Um, we'll do that. Yeah, some some links to these. A lot of people say that this commercial model of, of transporting the bees over distances. Um, can be problematic for the bees and some people go so far as to say that it's um, the um, major factor in, in things like colony collapse disorder because many of the bees raised in the United States are used for these pollination efforts. And, um, and talk about what the impact of moving is on the bees in terms of the orientation and ability to relocate their hive. Well, let me, let me work at this by analogy, okay? So I come to your house and you're, you know, you're, you're having fun in your house. You, you know where everything is. Am I hanging out with my family? Hanging out with your family. Having myself a party. Having yourself a party. Um, Unsolicited shout out of Birdemic. <laughs> shout out to Birdemic. <laughs> and Riff MSC3K Tracks. Riff Tracks. Right. Um, so then I come. My, my big hand comes down. I grab your house. And I gr take you to some other place. So, like, here we are. We're in, I think we're near the... And I only let you eat Cheetos the entire time. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like fun for about a day. Yeah. And but... then I pick you up and move you, and now all you can have is Doritos for yes. the entire time. 
And so uh, you start to see the problem. Not only are you malnourished, but you're in a strange place that you, you can't understand. So you can imagine that things would f uh, fail, fail to flourish in that environment. Any organism would fail to flourish. Well, if, you're, if your malnutrition is, is starting to get to you, if um, you're in a strange place that and you've never been And unable to orient before, according to the sun. And not understanding um, where the sun is, not understanding where the entrance of your hive is re related to the rest of uh, the rest of your surroundings, you then could and, have, hold on, you, then, sorry. then you're talking about being susceptible to disease. And there's a lot of diseases out there um, for bees. Um, I'm going to give an unsolicited endorsement of your post to our Tumblr, yes. spreadcast.tumblr.com. Uh, it's either cute or posted, your post about propolis. Yes, so by the time um, you so hear something this, else I realize, each time they that. move these colonies, they're breaking apart the boxes, they're scraping off the propolis, they're moving them, and propolis is such a product of the local environment, the mm -hmm. local plant resins that the bees collect, that when they're relocated to a different environment, it can't provide them with the same level of immunity. Yes. So the fact, the very fact that you have to dismantle the hive, scrape the propolis to move them, also compromises their colony immunity against um, local fungi, you know, viruses. Fungi, diseases, viruses. Yeah. So, yeah, take a look at that blog post about the bee's immune system. Um, I believe it's called R-E-S-P-E-C-T, Find Out What It Means to Bees. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> That's a about, good title. Um, the webmaster put the title on yeah, there. Yeah, it's about conducting respectful inspe hive inspections um, and understanding the function of propolis. The, the, the new research coming out about the function of propolis, you did a really nice job of linking to some current um, evidence-based research on the, the matter. Yeah. Um, the role of propolis in bee colony immunity. All right. There's another brief on here, and it's that um, Michigan's cherry crop, this is Traverse City, Michigan, um, is expected to be down this year because freezing temperatures in May freeze the cherries and then they fall off the tree. Oh. That's a bummer. You know, Mother Nature, you really experience her um, ambivalence sometimes when you work closely with the land. Especially and that's if you live in times. Michigan. Michigan, yeah. all bets are off, right? That's, that's one of those times. So we're sorry to hear that. Our hearts go out to those folks who are hoping for a local cherry harvest. And I'm, I wonder, I don't know how that will impact the market, but I feel really lucky to have our cherry grove. And uh, they I think it also one. potentially responded to the wood ash and the, the biochar that we dumped down there. So we can keep doing that. We know that the brambles respond well to that. It's part of our low-maintenance cultivation of our berry brambles, too. Also, Kansas farmers are getting flag smut disease, which I wonder if that's the corn smut. Um, I think that said it's on wheat. The, did it say that? I'm just, um, I'm now... Uh, You're beyond the scope of our <laughs> Of our agreement. Will has jumped the shark on I the have news highlights. gone beyond the, uh, the agenda here. All right, um, so let's wrap up. And we're at, yeah, people. we're almost at 50 minutes here, so... Um, Anything else that you wanted to mention about I the bees? No, no, I think Projects, we're good. Projects, honey. No, I wanted to request... Do you mind if I move down the agenda? I'm nope. going to request um, that Robert's if you have... Tools. Actually, we're a consensus-based operation around here. Yeah, we're not using Robert's rules. Oh, we should mention one other thing while we're talking about operational procedure. We are very excited to announce that we recently reserved received our state certificate yes. of incorporation yes we are a real live corporation now we have to announce it too yeah so look for it in the newspaper but satyama homestead inc is a legitimate corporation incorporation on file with the pennsylvania and so we'll be working on um well i should say will as chief accounting officer uh -huh. as well as chief grants officer and chief pollination officer yes we'll be working CPO. on pursuing our 501c5 filing which is for agricultural horticultural nonprofits. Uh, because the primary thing that we're about here at satayama homestead is sharing information and knowledge for the improvement of small-scale home-based agriculture and horticulture um, and related livestock like the chickens which we mentioned their manure contributions their grazing contributions and the bees which obviously have pollination contributions so you can check us out online find your way to satayamahs.org that's s-a-t-o-y-a-m-a-h-s dot o-r-g yes as yes. well as our Tumblr, where we're sharing even more information, photos, some videos, etc. That's at spreadcast.tumblr.com. 
which is also linked from the, the Satyam Homestead site, but you can find that at S-P-R-E-A-D-C-A-S-T-S dot T-U-M-B-L-R dot C-O-M. And on there, we have an Ask Us Anything Ask link. Us Almost Anything. Almost Anything. Not quite everything. I mean, you can try. Yeah. We'll see what we can do. All right. But um, there's an Ask Us Almost Anything link on there where you can send us a question. We'd love to read it on the next podcast. Yeah, and possibly answer it. And possibly answer it. <laughs> All questions will be read, but only the select few will be answered. Yes. So send us your questions. We'd love to, we'd love to have them. Um, yeah, that pretty much wraps up our agenda here. Original Transplant signing off. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening.